Good morning to our online viewers. We are glad that you have joined us. This morning, Pastor Mark is going to begin a new sermon series that will come out of the book of James. He's going to bring us insights that's going to help us during this season that we are currently in, and we are excited that you have joined us. Just a few announcements. We are going to have the chance to participate in a digital vacation Bible school this week. You can find that on our website. You can go to the Facebook page that is OK District Treasure Quest, or you can go to our webpage, efnas.org, and you can find a link to that. That will be this week, Monday through Thursday, starting at 630. You can watch it this week, or it will be available on YouTube after that. If you're busy or have other things going this week, you'll be able to catch it further down the road. We will continue the way that we are doing things for uh, at least a little bit longer, um, probably the most of the summer, where we will have a 10 o'clock worship service, but we will hold off on having other small groups on Wednesday nights or Sunday school classes until we let you know. Um, and we'll be sure and give you advance notice on that, let you know through online, through our webpage, uh, through Sanctuary, through other means. So until then, we will gather here at 10 o'clock, but we want you to continue to feel safe and do whatever you feel the most comfortable with. We will continue to post our sermons online as well. Let's stop and pray this morning. Dear God, we do thank you. We thank you for the privilege that we can come together, that we can focus on you, that we can hear your word, and that we can ask you to use it to penetrate our hearts, to penetrate our will, to help us to be better Christians, to be better examples, to just to empower us to do the things that you've called us to do. We are excited about what these days hold, even though they are different and we're not used to them. We know that you are still with us in the midst of these uncommon days. I pray that you would use us as individuals, use us as a community, use us as the church to continue to make a difference. We love you and we will give you all the praise and all the glory. It's in the strong name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Holy Spirit, rain.
church so nice to to be with you today and I'm anxious to to begin this new summer series from the epistle of James I I like James this is one of my favorite books of the Bible it's certainly one of my favorite epistles and and by the way for you young Christians uh, an epistle is not a wife of an apostle <laughs> and a, an epistle is simply a letter uh, written by one of the apostles. Now, James is what I would call an epistle of common sense. He, uh, he just makes good sense when he writes, and, and wow, couldn't we, couldn't we use a little more common sense these days? I, I have found myself saying out loud, this world has lost its collective mind. <laughs> People People are just acting crazy, but then again, maybe, maybe they're not acting. I don't know. One of, one of my crazy friends, one of my many crazy friends on Facebook uh, posted uh, uh, this, said something to the effect that the most normal thing that's happened in the year 2020 is the Netflix series Tiger King, the story of Joe Exotic from right down the road in Winniewood, Winnie Oklahoma. Uh, these are certainly uncommon times. I think we'd all uh, all agree with that, and some common sense uh, would go uh, a long ways. I I believe that the writings of James can can really help us in the times we're facing, uh, because he's writing to a group that's uh, also facing some very uncommon times, and and he walks God's people through a step by step process, uh, the things that they need to do not only to, to endure the crisis that they're facing, but he, he actually gives them handles to help them understand that this is the time for their faith to grow and flourish. And, and, and I believe this. I believe the times that we're in now, this is the time for our faith to grow. It's, time, it's the time for our spiritual roots to go down deep. I love trees, and if you know anything about trees, how tall they grow is determined uh, by how deep the root system is. And, and, and what is seen uh, is determined, the health of what is seen is determined by what is unseen, what's, what's underneath the ground. And we know that during times of drought, something we know about here in Oklahoma, what, what do trees do? The, those roots go down even deeper in search of water to nourish it. And my prayer for us is that we, as we study uh, this epistle of James, that, that it will be like living water for our souls. And that in the crisis we're facing, that our roots will go deeper not that, and not become shallow. Now, James is, is only five chapters long. And you could, you could read it in a quick setting, but uh, man, it is, it is jam-packed with practical advice for people in a crisis. Uh, now, if you're not familiar with who James is, he is actually the half-brother of, of Jesus. I, I say half-brother because they shared the same mother, Mary, but uh, we know that Christ had a heavenly father. What's interesting about James is that... Uh, uh, as young men, he was not a fan of his brother Jesus. Uh, I mean, think about it. If your brother says uh, that he is the son of God, he's the Messiah, he's the savior of the world, uh, wouldn't, wouldn't you have some questions about that? I, I know I would. But something changed. After, after Jesus proved that he was who he said he was and, and, and rose from the dead, everything changed for James. He 
My goodness, he got on board and, and not only did he become a, a believer, he became an incredible leader in the church of Jesus Christ. I want you to look with me at the very first verse in James chapter 1, verse 1. From James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, greetings to all God's people scattered over the whole world. You see, James is writing to people in a crisis just like us. But, in, but instead of being quarantined, these people were, were scattered throughout the world. Why? Why were the people of God scattered? It wasn't a pandemic. It was persecution. That was their crisis. They were, they were being evicted from their homes. They were being killed, murdered for their faith. I mean, it, it was an unbelievably scary time. Can you, can you imagine being murdered for being a follower of Jesus Christ? That was their crisis. And so today, I, I just want to hit the highlights of, of each of these five chapters so that we can get a sense of where we're going to be throughout the summer in, in this series. And as we skim through the letter of James, it will become very clear to you that the overlying theme of his letter is Christian maturity. Uh, he really wants the people that he's writing to, to grow in their faith. So how, how, do, you, how do you know if you, uh, that you're growing in your faith, that you're maturing as, as a believer? Uh, there's a slogan that, that our church has, has used through the years, Edmund First Church of the Nazarene, a place to grow. And that is the desire of, of our hearts. As the staff, we want we want our, our people to become fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. We, we want our people to grow in their faith, and that's what God wants us to do, to grow in grace and in the knowledge of, of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. But how do we know? How do we know if we're growing and, and maturing? Well, let me look at the other side of that. How, uh, let, let me tell you, first of all, what spiritual maturity isn't. Uh, first of all, it's not about age, uh, how old you are. You know, usually in the church, we think that the spiritual giants of the church, the, the, the seasoned saints, you've you got to be at least age 70 or above to, to, to be in that number. <laughs> but spiritual maturity really has nothing to do with, with how long you've lived on earth or, or even how long you've been a Christian. I mean, I've seen people, and, and you have too, I'm sure, seen people who have claimed to be uh, 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 Christians for, for over 50 years, but yet they're still as immature and carnal <laughs> and cantankerous as can be. So spiritual maturity isn't necessarily about age, and it has nothing to do with appearance. Uh, my, my grandson Milo uh, is only three years old, but, but everybody thinks he's He's like six or seven. I mean, he's, he's, a, he's a big kid, and, and, and honestly, people think I'm older because uh, older than I am because I, I'm big for my age, too. <laughs> so you're not necessarily spiritually, you know, I really need, need to have some laugh tracks when I, when I preach to an empty room like this. <laughs> uh, so I'm assuming you're laughing with me. So you're not necessarily spiritually be mature because you're old or or you even look saintly. Uh, spiritual maturity isn't about achievement or accomplishments or, or even academics. I mean, you could, you could graduate summa cum laude from the seminary, or thank you, Lottie, like I did, but, but academics will, will not make you spiritually mature. So, so what is it? Uh, how is spiritual maturity really measured? I believe it's determined by our attitude. Attitude makes the difference. And, and, and the Bible says in, in Philippians chapter 2 that we're to have the same attitude of Jesus Christ, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a, a man, just like us. And he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. So, so if you want to 
If you want to measure your spiritual maturity, don't, don't look for, for somebody else to measure yourself against. I mean, you, you can always find somebody that's going to make you look good. <laughs> if you're going to measure your spiritual maturity, then measure yourself alongside the life of Jesus Christ and have his attitude. Uh, in the epistle to James, uh, it, it's, it's, really, it's really a manual of how to live like Jesus, how to, how to love like Jesus, and, and how to become spiritually mature like Jesus. In each of these five chapters, James gives us a marker to measure ourselves. It's something we don't like to do. I, I, I don't you know, I don't mind when I go to the doctor to check the height. I'm, by the way, I'm getting shorter, but that, you know, stepping on the scales. But they measure everything. They measure your blood pressure, me measure all that stuff. And today, it, it's, it's going to be a little painful. But I, I want us to look at these markers from each chapter and see, on a scale of one to five, how we're doing when it comes to growing in our faith. The first mark of a mature follower of Jesus Christ, James tells us, is that they're cool under pressure. <laughs> I love the way that James rolls up his sleeves and gets right to business in chapter one. He doesn't have any lengthy greetings or introductions. He basically says, hi, hey, this is James. Now we need to talk. And he gets right after it. No small talk. And look what he says in verse two. Considered a sheer gift, friends, when tests and challenges come at you from all sides, a sheer gift. <laughs> you know that under pressure, your faith life is forced into the open and shows its true colors. So don't try to get out of anything prematurely. Let it do its work. So you become what? Mature and well-developed not deficient in any way. Uh, that's the first mark. How do you handle pressure? How do you respond when the heat is on? Uh, how do you react to the tests and the challenge that life throws at you? And, and understand, the people that James is writing to were under incredible, unbelievable pressure, more pressure than that, then what we're facing with, with this virus or, or even the social unrest of our day, I mean, it, it, all of what we're going through, is, is, it, it just pales in comparison. Think, and, and think about this uh, from a personal standpoint. What's the first prayer that we usually pray when we're under pressure, when we're facing a test and challenges in life? Uh, here's how I usually pray. I, I usually pray something like this. God, God, could you, uh, <laughs> could you maybe help, help ease some of this pressure that I'm under? Hmm. Is that the way you pray? Uh, God, <laughs> or, or even to the other, God, could you just get me out of this mess? Just, just boo, take me out. <laughs> this, is, this is too much, Lord. I, I just can't handle it. But James says, what you're going through just might be a sheer gift. <laughs> we don't usually think in those terms. He says, think of it as a gift, something that's going to force you to grow and to develop and mature in your faith. So James says, don't try to get out of this thing too quickly. See, see what God might be up to here and how he might be able to use what you're going through to help you to become a more complete follower of Jesus Christ. Uh, what, what's the old saying? What, what, doesn't, what doesn't kill you <laughs> will make you stronger. So through the pressures we've been facing, what we should be praying, church, is Lord, help us to learn what we need to learn through this pandemic. How, how, can, how can this make us stronger? And, and, and how, can it, how can it help us as a church of Jesus Christ to become more effective and impactful in the days to come? How can, how can this make me a better Christian? And then in chapter 2, James talks about a second mark. He says that a mature follower of Jesus Christ, and that is that we're to be sensitive to others. 
So take a little sensitivity quiz. How, how sensitive are you to the needs of others? Uh, look at verse 8. Chapter 2, verse 8. In fact, right where you are, just read it out loud with me. You will do all right if you obey the most important law in the scriptures. It is the law that commands us to love others as much as we love ourselves. A growing believer cares about the needs of others. They are sensitive to the concerns of others. They're, they're compassionate. James says, if you care about others, you're on the right track. Give yourself a, a good mark here. So, so the mark of a mature believer is selflessness. The opposite would be true, that, that the mark of an immature believer would be selfishness. Hey, I, I got to take care of number one. I, uh, I got to do what's best for me. Uh, they're, they're oblivious. They're uncaring. They're, they're insensitive to the needs of others. But that, my brothers and sisters, goes against the greatest law given in this book. The royal command is to love your neighbor better than you do yourself. Here's what I believe. Here's what I believe, church, and I believe it with all my heart. The royal command given in God's word could cure our society of racism. <laughs> I hope you said amen right there. And, and let me say this. In God's eyes, there's really only one race, the human race. And we need to agree on, on that fact. Uh, according to the, to the gospel, red lives matter. According to this gospel, yellow lives matter. According to the gospel, black lives matter and white lives matter. We, and, and when I say we, I'm, I'm talking about white people. Uh, we need to be more sensitive now than ever before to, to the needs of our black brothers and sisters because they really do need to know that their lives matter. Well, you might say, well, well their life doesn't matter any more than mine. Well, uh, that's, not what, that's not what they're saying. And, and by the way, that's, that's really a, a spiritually immature response. The royal command tells us that we're to love others as much as we love ourselves. Do black matter, lives matter more than white lives, lives? You know the answer is no. D does every life matter? Of course. But we need to be sensitive today to the fact that there is a, a large segment of African Americans who don't believe and don't understand that their lives really matter. Church, we can help them. <laughs> this is the time for us to rise up. Better yet, we can show them the good news that their lives really do matter. Last week, last week I was sitting in my, my, my recliner working. Uh, I don't sleep in my recliner, by the way. I work in my recliner. I don't know how you operate. <laughs> I was sitting in my recliner, and I was, I was working uh, on my laptop, and the, the twins, our grandchildren, uh, Luke and Anna, they turned eight last week. They were over the house, and, and Anna comes up to me, and she's just, she's just staring at me, and I can, I can feel her eyes <laughs> piercing me as I'm sitting there working on my laptop. And she says, Poppy, what, what you doing? I said, well, I'm, uh, I'm working on my sermon. I, I, I'm, I'm writing my sermon here for Sunday. She says, oh, oh, good. Uh, Poppy, could, could I write something in your sermon? <laughs> I said, now listen, Anna. I said, this is, this is uh, something that I have to preach to my people. And, and so I'm going to let you write something. But I want you to know, I want you to understand that whatever you write on my laptop here, what, whatever you write in this sermon, I'm going to share it with my people Sunday morning. And she says, okay, Poppy. And got a big smile on her face. And so I handed her the laptop, and she thought long and hard about it. She was, she was very thoughtful about it, and I, I, I was really kind of anxious what she was going to write <laughs> and if I really was going to keep my word on uh, sharing everything that she wrote. 
when she handed the laptop back to me. Here's what it said, and I'll read it to you. She says, today we will be saying John 3.16. <laughs> so right now, church, <laughs> we're going to do what Anna says. Say it with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I think that moment was providential. I think we all need to be reminded that God loves this world, the whole world. And what a great time for us, church, to share with our black brothers and sisters that there is a God in heaven that not only loves them, but gave his life for them and that they matter to him and that they matter to us. This is the time for us to be sensitive and to employ the royal command, the greatest command found in this book. Look, look, I, I, I don't know a lot of things. I, uh, I know about my experience. I, I know what it's like to come out of a, an impoverished holler <laughs> in the hills of West Virginia. And then when we moved to Columbus, Ohio, a, a metropolitan uh, city, people, people made fun of us. <laughs> and it hurt my feelings, you know. Uh, they, they made fun of the way we talked. They, they made fun of what we ate. They just they couldn't get on board with this beans and cornbread stuff. Bless their hearts. God help them. <laughs> they called us hillbillies. <laughs> By the way, we would prefer to be called Appalachian Americans. I know my experience, but I know what it's like to be an Appalachian American, but honestly, I don't know. I don't know what it's like to be an African American. I don't, I don't know what it's like to be a black man in today's society. And, but I, I want to tell you this. I've been asking God to help me, to help me be more sensitive, to, be, to, to live out the royal law. Just last week, uh, around lunchtime, I got this hankering to eat. That's what happens to me on a real regular basis. And believe it or not, I had a hankering for beans and cornbread. <laughs> and there's a little, little diner up the street around the corner here on 15th Street that every day they have beans and cornbread. Okay, they have pinto beans, they have, they have navy beans, and they have some pretty good coconut cream pie. It's not as good as Rebecca Schwartz's pie, but it's pretty good pie. And, and I noticed when I, and I love the place because it's, you know, everybody knows your name. <laughs> and uh, I, I noticed that they had a new cook. He was an African-American gentleman. And, and after I ate, you know what God prompted me to do? <laughs> you know, the, you can see the cook right there. It's a small diner. God told me, I, I believe God told me, sometimes we... We tell, God, tell things on God that he really didn't tell us, but I, I really think he prompted me, and, and, and I was obedient. I wrestled with him a little bit, a bit about, about it, but, but I went up to him, and I said, young man, your life matters. Your life matters. And he, and he smiled, and he warmly received, and I said, and it really, really mattered to me today because there was some good beans and cornbread. <laughs> In chapter 3, James gives us another mark. I guess we could stop right there with the two and see how we're doing. <laughs> but let's keep going. In chapter 3, James gives us another mark of, of, uh, of a mature follower of Jesus Christ. He says that if, if we're really strong in our faith, we're, we're going to be careful about what we say. We're going to be careful with our words. Look what he, look what he says in chapter 3 and verse 2. He says, we all fail in many areas. Do I need to stop right there and preach a little? <laughs> we all fail in many areas, but especially with our words. Wow. <laughs> Yet if we're able to bridle the words, we say we are powerful enough to control ourselves in every way, and that means our character is mature 
and fully developed. I, uh, I despise when I go to the doctor and he takes that nasty tasting supersized popsicle stick and he says, stick out your tongue, preacher. <laughs> I hate it when he does that. Why does he do that? Because my doctor can tell a lot about my health just by looking at my tongue. You know, God does that with us. He can tell a lot about our spiritual health by the condition of our tongue. If, if, if you're a whiner, if you're a criticizer, if you're a liar, if you're a gossiper, it's a sure sign that you're not developing in your faith like you should be. And we'll, we'll talk more about that in the weeks to come. But spiritually mature believers control their speech. In chapter 4, James tells us that a mature disciple of Jesus Christ is a peacemaker, not a troublemaker. Troublemaker. Have, have you noticed that tr troublemakers are just everywhere? They're, they're at work, they're at home, they're, they're at school, they're in the neighborhood, they're, they're even at church. You might even be sitting next to a troublemaker. I don't know. Some people just like to fuss and fight and be contentious. It's their way or the highway. But James makes it clear that that people like that are spiritual brats and they just need to grow up. Look what he says in chapter 4, verse 1. What's the cause of your conflicts and quarrels with each other? Doesn't the battle begin inside of you as you fight to have your own way and fulfill your own desires? Then look on down, verse 11. Don't speak evil against each other, dear brothers and sisters. If you criticize and judge each other, then you are criticizing and judging God's law. Your job is to obey the law, not to judge whether it applies to you. God alone, who gave the law, is the judge. So what right do you have to judge your neighbor? Ouch. <laughs> Finally, James tells us in his closing chapter that mature followers of Jesus Christ are patiently prayerful. Verse 7 and 8 of chapter 5. Meanwhile, friends, wait patiently for the Lord's arrival. <laughs> Man, I found myself saying, oh, Lord, come quickly. In these days, Lord, come quickly. But wait patiently for the Lord's arrival. You see, farmers do this all the time, waiting for their valuable crops to what? To mature, patiently letting the rain do its slow but sure work. Be patient like that, church. Stay steady and strong. Jesus could arrive at any time. So, church, let's be like farmers. Let's let's patiently wait. Farmers do an awful lot of waiting. You know, they prepare the soil, they, they, they plant the seeds, uh, they fertilize it, they, they fight the bugs, they pray for rain, and then they hurry up and wait. <laughs> they wait, and they wait some more. They wait patiently. You see, there, there are no overnight crops. Nothing's microwaved on the farm. <laughs> The same is true in growing our faith. It is, it is a process. It comes from a seed that's been planted in our heart. And the spiritual maturity takes place as we patiently let God do his good work in refining us like gold. And the key to being patient is prayer. Look, look at this last verse, verse 16. The prayer of a person living right with God is something powerful. To be reckoned with. <laughs> Do you receive God's word today? Amen. Well, before I pray, I want to ask you how you did. Five marks. How, how'd you measure up? Uh, were you three for five? Were you two for five? <laughs> Maybe you were all for five. Well, we've got all summer to work, work on this, but let me ask you today. How are you handling the pressures of life right now? How, how, how have you been handling this pandemic situation, the social unrest, everything else that's going on in the world today? Are you staying cool under pressure? Are, are you being sensitive to the needs of others or are you walking through this life only seeing what you want to see, doing what you want to do and fulfilling your own desires or are you, are you living out that royal command to love others 
and to treat others better than yourself. How about your tongue? <laughs> Is it in check or are you just, you just saying whatever you're thinking? Oh, put it through the filter, folks. <laughs> are, are you a troublemaker or are you a peacemaker? Are you patient and are you prayer, prayerful? Let's pray about it. Some of us need to pray. Lord, teach me to be positive under the pressures I'm facing right now. Others need to ask God to help you be more sensitive to the needs of others. And you, you could, listen, you could start, start at home. Be more patient with your spouse. Be, be more sensitive to the needs of your children, the people under your own roof. That's the good starting point. Some, some of us need to ask God to help us put a, put a bridle on our tongue. It's gotten us into a lot of trouble. All of us. All of us need to be patiently prayerful. Let's pray. Well, Lord, uh, James has hit us all right between the eyes today. Help us. Help us to grow in the midst of this crisis that we're facing. Teach us to do better. And then, God, empower us to be better. May we all be patient prayerfully patient until we can get to the other side of, of all that our society is going through. But most of all, most of all, Lord, help us to live out the royal command to love others and to treat others even better than ourselves. And I have prayed this in the name of the Father and of the Son and the blessed Holy Spirit. And God's people said, Amen. God bless you. I love you.